Well, hello and welcome to this Institute for Government events, um, one year on from the white paper, looking at what, how much progress has been delivered. Um, I'm delighted to um, be joined by a fantastic panel here today. I'd like to take this moment to thank Policy at Manchester, um, who are the uh, University of Manchester's um, Policy Engagement Unit, um, who are here and have very kindly supported the event. And it's great to have Richard um, here to provide his insights and expertise as well. Um, I think now is an excellent time to be looking at this question, just over 12 months since the um, white paper was published. Um, the phrase levelling up, of course, first came to prominence in 2019, but it was the white paper a year ago that, that really solidified what, what the government meant by that phrase. But it's been a, a pretty tumultuous year, I think it's fair to say. The Prime Minister of that time is no longer in post, um, and nor is uh, his successor. Um, the Secretary of State for levelling up is still in post, but had a summer hiatus. Um, the cost of living crisis has come to dominate the, the policy debates, um, as it hadn't been um, early February last year. And at the same time, Labour have um, sort of thrown its version of the levelling up white paper into the ring with the, the Brown Commission. Um, and now it seems that further devolution across England is broadly a cross-party commitment. So where are we now with levelling up? Has the government actually made any strides in the last year? And what are the prospects for this policy agenda, whether or not the name stays um, for the next years and beyond that? So it's great to have um, a wonderful panel today. Joining me online is Councillor Abby Brown, who's leader of Stoke-on-Trent City Council. Welcome, Abby. Um, to my right is Annalise Dodds, who's the chair of the Labour Party and the Labour Policy Forum, um, and was a commissioner on the um, Brown Commission as well. She's also Shadow Secretary of State for Equalities. Um, to my immediate left, we have Professor Richard Jones, who's the Vice President of Regional Innovation and Civic Engagement at the University of Manchester. And to my far left, Councillor Jane Mudds, who's the Vice Chair of the Western Gateway Partnership and a leader of Newport City Council. Just a bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, this event will be on the record. There's a live recording and a live recording, if you want to watch it back later, uh, a, a recorded version will be on our website um, shortly. Uh, we'll be tweeting from the, um, ha from the account at IFG events using the hashtag, hashtag IFG leveling up. So please do join um, in the conversation there. We're gonna have plenty of time for questions. Um, for those in the room, do be thinking of those questions already and there'll be a roving mic to come round so do wait for those and for those online you can start adding your questions straight away to the Slido and we'll have plenty of time for your questions as well. Um, so I think that um, is all of the housekeeping which means that we can now get on with the main events um, and Abby Brown I'll start with you. It's now more than three years since that um, election campaign when levelling up was a key slogan. One year on since the white paper fleshed that out. Um, what progress do you think has been made on that agenda? Well, thank you for um, inviting me to join today. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but busy at the moment. And uh, although Stoke is much closer to London than most people think, it's still a significant chunk out of my day to come down for an hour or so. So grateful for the opportunity to join you virtually. Um, I guess the point that I would start off by making is that whatever the government and whichever government um, call this project, places like Stoke-on-Trent um, are prime targets for levelling up. Um, in, in fact, a couple of years ago, you know, my, my big catch line was launched that Stoke-on-Trent is the litmus test for levelling up. I think the challenge for government today, but also governments in the future, is their scale and understanding of what investment is actually needed to level up. We'll go with calling it levelling up at the moment, seeing as that's what, um, <laughs> that's what we call it by. For me, it's about investment in both places and also people. So um, a couple of years ago, we launched our own prospectus in Stoke-on-Trent with the four key things that we said to the government, you know, you need to come and help us with. Um, and I, it's not a coincidence that 50% of those were about places and 50% were actually about people. It's really easy to forget that people are an absolute key part of this. It's about improving life chances as well as about bringing forward um, investment and improving facilities. And to underline that, each place is unique. Um, my place is very different to anywhere else that might be a levelling up place or a left behind place. I think we have seen over the last few years, this has been very much at times been about maybe north versus south or rural versus urban. But actually, I think for me, that does underline that places are different and that every place is different and has its own challenges. Equally, um, you know, again, investment we've seen um, 
through the Lively Not Fund has gone into buildings, jobs, homes, uh, you know, and I'm pleased that Stoke on Trent has been the biggest recipient of Lively Not Up funding, £56 million pounds worth of very much needed funding. But I think there is also, as I say, that need to recognise investment into skills, health inequalities. Um, and I personally feel that there's been a bit less focus here, particularly around health and productivity. That's a huge issue for us in Stoke on Trent. Um, and I'm not sure yes, let, yet that we've got there. The other thing I guess I would say is that commitment to longer term change um, about, uh, so for example, improving public health. You can't do that in a year. You can't do that in two years. You have to have a long term commitment to delivering challenges and changes such as that. And I think we need to see that continue moving forward. Finally, I would say a huge role for local government. Um, I'm a big supporter of local government. The white paper mentions devolution. Um, and equally, as you mentioned, you know, we started to see that sort of narrative coming from the opposition. But I think for me, it's really important that whoever's in charge recognises the differences in areas and also with opportunities. There's been a big focus, hasn't there, on devolution uh, around what I would call democratic span. We need mayors. Do we have combined authorities? But actually, I would say there's a really strong argument to just empower local government as it is. So, for example, simple, what I would call simple responsibilities, skills. We're perfectly set up to deliver that as it is. Why do I have to commit to something else to be given the ability to do something that we could immediately crack on with? So um, I guess that that's probably kind of my sum, summary of where we've got to, you know, think been conflicting comments on the traction of levelling up. I would say here in Stoke-on-Trent, it has name recognition. If you go outside and ask people about levelling up, might not be able to describe to you what it is, but they understand it is a word. So I would say if this was a, a school term paper, Good start, but need to grow breadth and depth. We'll give it six out of ten. Thanks very much, Abby. That's a, a really helpful starting contribution. Richard, you're an expert in innovation and regional development. Do you think the white paper and what we've seen since has got sort of the right ingredients to deliver on the missions that it laid out, those 12 missions for 2030? Is there, are there other things you'd have hoped to see from the government in the last year? Well, I think you know, it'd be a pity if it, it, white paper is 297 pages long, so it would be... Uh, strange if it didn't have all the ingredients in. <laughs> it is actually a really interesting document. It's got a, a very good analysis of what the problems are. Uh, ironic, of course, that one of the things it really stressed was the need for policy longevity. And so the, uh, the churn that we've seen in the, in the past year, I think, has been uh, really important. But in terms of, uh, you know, I think it's worth separating out two elements in the, in the kind of levelling up agenda. There's a kind of short term issue about, you know, how do you restore pride in place? What are the kind of small interventions that you can make that can have quick returns in terms of people feeling better about where they live? Uh, and, you know, the Leveling Up Fund has uh, done some of that. Uh, uh, of course, one can criticise the, the way it happened. But I think that the second element, if you like, is the much more long-term and difficult one, which is just how do you raise the economic performance of those parts of the country which currently don't fulfil their potential? And, that, you know, uh, as we mentioned, I mean, different places have different needs, but, you know, we've got big second-tier cities that are just underperforming, that their, their, their economies are uh, performing below the UK average, which, you know, my colleague in Manchester, Phil McCann, has stressed. This is really very odd. This is not like uh, other European countries. Big cities should be drivers of the economy, and they're not. You've got deindustrialised towns, conurbations, you know, Barnsley, Oldham, Dudley, that, that they have d different problems. And then, then you've got rural and coastal peripheries. So, uh, you know, Blackpool or Pembrokeshire in, in, in places that actually have very weak economies. Uh, I think the, there were four of the missions were focused on this business of, uh, of achieving economic growth. It was this, you know, boost productivity, pay jobs and living standards by growing the private sector, they said. And I kind of, you know, I agree with that. That's, that, that, that's a, a really sound goal. And of course, the area I'm most interested in is R&D, research and development. And there, the, 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 the levelling up white paper did pick up this point that myself and others, my colleague from Leeds, Tom Ford, very effectively about you know how wrong it is that so much r and d is concentrated in those places that are already the most prosperous so we did have this commitment thirty three percent uplift by twenty five forty percent by twenty thirty and I think this r and d target of of increasing r and d outside the greater southeast it's kind of interesting because it's at once too ambitious and not ambitious enough it's not ambitious enough because essentially the 33% uplift is just committing to uh, that that's actually 
the, the, the total uplift that the government's promised anyway. So the, the promise actually is just not to make things worse. It's not to, to, to make things better. But on the other hand, it's really challenging because they're huge structural factors that, that, that have got us into this situation now. And when it comes to specific interventions, there, there, there was in fact only one. There was the, uh, the, the Innovation Accelerator program, which is, you know, as a recipient of that in Greater Manchester, it's a good thing, but it was 100 million, well, it's essentially 50 million a year from a budget that's going to 20 billion. It's not very much. We've seen things like the Strength in Places Fund, which actually I, I, I thought was very good. It benefited Amis uh, City, the, 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 it supported advanced, the advanced ceramics industry in Stokes. Uh, supported compound semiconductor uh, 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 cluster in, in, in South Wales, that fund's not being continued. So th th there's something odd there. But I think the key issue is we can't, you can't just kind of ha issue a target and say, you know, we're just going to shove funds north. You actually have to make capacity. You have to create capacity, and that's connected to those other goals about supporting manufacturing, promoting the adoption and diffusion of technology, as well as the development of new technology. So I think that there needs to be much more focus on how do you build innovation capacity as much or more in the private sector as in the public sector. I guess the other thing I want to say is that the missions are great, but what there is a bit of a lack is connection between the missions. I mean, innovation and skills is somewhere where absolutely there needs to be a much deeper connection than there is now. So you need to build a skill system, not for you know, places with weak economies, the skills system needs to be the skill system you would want for the better, more high-performing economy than you aspire to, rather than what, you, what you've got. You've got to join up spatial planning and transport. And I'm really glad that Abby mentioned health disparities, because that's a, a huge uh, a, a weakness, I think, in the follow-up to the Leveling Up white paper. I mean, I did. I, I, I looked up the numbers for a, a, a talk I did a, a week or two ago. To, you know, to sh the shocking figure that in Oldham, healthy life expectancy is 58. In in in, in Oxfordshire, it's nearly 10 years more. I actually looked up for the Stoke figure because I knew that Abby was on this thing, and it's actually even worse. The Stoke figure is 56.7. So it's more than 10 years difference in healthy life expectancy. And of course, that's a huge human tragedy, but it's also a huge drag on the economy. And health, outcome, health disparities and productivity are absolutely intimately linked both ways. Poor places have, have poor health outcomes. The poor health co outcomes lead to lower productivity. That then feeds this vicious circle. So I think it's a real pity that the, the levelling up white paper promised a health disparities white paper. That has not appeared, and I think that's, a, a, that's really sad. So the, you know, this is all about strategy. You need a joined up strategy. It needs to happen at the level of a city or a region. You know, back in the days of Greg Clark, we had local industrial strategies. We actually were, were, weren't a bad thing. And Greater Manchester did one. We still, uh, we, we're still working to it. it we, we think it was a very sound evidence-based piece of work. They were scrapped, of course, by Kwasi Kwarteng when he was uh, Bayes Minister. But it needs to be local. It needs to understand the texture of the local economy. You need capacity in local regions, in local government, to be able to develop strategies to, uh, and to, to, to work out what needs to be done. You know, in Greater Manchester, we have got this, this thing called Innovation Greater Manchester, bringing together the private sector, combined authority, public sector, uh, public sector research, and increasingly the FE colleges have to be a part of that. So we've got all the universities collaborating, increasingly talking to the FE colleges too. So I think, you know, it's about strategy. You need to have a constructive relationship between the region and the center. <laughs> There, there is, there's painful bureaucracy that surrounds some of the, the interventions that we've seen so far, and I can't help mentioning we'd be, we're really anxious to get on with our Innovation Accelerator programme. We've got lots of great programmes, but it's still sat in the Horse Guards Road waiting for its Treasury sign-off. Uh, but, yeah. No, that's, that's excellent. Thanks, Richard. Lots of, lots of really good threads that we'll no, no doubt come back to later in discussion there as well. Um, Jane, Wales and the Western Gateway more broadly um, wasn't sort of part of the original red wall focus of levelling up, but it is a region with many of the economic and other challenges that the levelling up white paper looks to solve. Um, so has levelling up made a tangible difference there yet? Well, I 
think we're quite an interesting um, region in that we bring together a partnership that spans two countries and involves two governments. And I think really that sets us apart a little bit in, in terms of um, some of the challenges we face, but also some of the opportunities that are available to us as well. Um, what I would say with regard to levelling up, and you mentioned the, the kind of red wall discussion, I think that's slightly unhelpful because I think we all recognise that across the whole of the UK, we've got um, pockets of deprivation close to um, pockets of affluence. So it's, it's, it's really a more complex relationship than that, isn't it? And we see that acro across our region, of course. We've got some deindustrialised cities and towns within the Western Gateway region, but we've also got some rural areas that are really suffering in some quite significant um, levels of deprivation. And also there's the significant health impacts as that that Richard's already talked about. But we've built our partnership um, together. It's grown organically. So it started out as the Great Western Cities Initiative, Cardiff, Newport and Bristol. And now we, we span from Swansea to Swindon. We've got local authorities involved, um, combined authorities, mayors, uh, the academia and of course business and, and I'd really like to emphasize how important it is to engage with business at this level on, on, on the regional basis. I think that's really important. I think there's a perception really with, with this narrative, this, this north-south and, and it, it doesn't help us in terms of driving the economy forwards and I'm really pleased that Richard mentioned the 12 missions as well. Because when I was starting to think about this, thinking about this in the con context of, of the missions, actually, my focus moved to productivity. So how has the investment through levelling up actually helped to increase productivity? And I think the evidence on that is very limited at this stage. Uh, and that's something that we need to look at more closely in future. Now, across our region, there's been some, some success in terms of uh, bidding for this but actually something else that's really unhelpful about this is the competitive process mm -hmm. and I'd like to go back to the other point that Richard made about bringing together be, bringing um, representatives of different areas together to plan this in a strategic way rather than pitting um, local authorities against each other to compete for scarce resources because the reality is those resources have already declined as well. So in response to your question, I think it's a slightly more complex picture than, than the question um, paints. Thanks very much, Jane. And Annalise, to you. So your party has been quite critical of the government's approach to levelling up. Um, but the Gordon Brown Commission reached some similar conclusions to the white paper in some areas. So where do you think the government's going wrong in its approach to levelling up? Yeah, well, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me to be part of this really fascinating discussion. Um, I would say that there was agreement, perhaps, around some of what the problem is, but a very different set of solutions. Um, so, you know, I would agree with Richard in saying that that almost 300-page report did set out the fact that there is growing regional inequality. I don't think that was a huge surprise to anybody, to be honest, but it, it did arguably examine that inequality and set out how many existing government policies might relate to that inequality. However, we feel it was deficient in three ways, and I, I'd say in terms of its kind of theory of change and then the scope and scale of change that's needed. So, first of all, very often it's felt like that levelling up discussion has been divorced from governments thinking around economic policy more broadly and why we might be experiencing growth or otherwise. Well, we believe that actually regional inequality is one of the reasons why we've had such sluggish growth over the last 13 years. And that if you do have so many parts of the country which have been growing so slowly, that's part of the reason why we've had those economic problems. So you can't grow the economy with only a few businesses in a few places with a few people. You need to have it bottom up across the country with businesses in every part of the country, with people in every part of the country. So there's a different theory of, of change really there from the beginning, I would say. Secondly, there's a very different view of the, the scope of change that's needed if you look within both Gordon's commission, but also then the speech that Keir Starmer gave at the turn of the year and to take back control acts that we would want to pass early on a Labour government, it sets out, 
yes, some of the areas that are covered within that white paper, you know, it does focus on transport going considerably further, but it also focuses on childcare, for example, so critical for different parts of the country where local authorities can't engage to deal with some of the market failures in different areas. Um, it looks at community control over assets, how you could really push that forward, what Lisa Nandy has set out there. It also looks at areas like energy efficiency, where we've had an incredibly centralised approach, one that's failed recently, unfortunately, over recent years, and instead saying this should be driven by an understanding of local supply chains, of local labour markets. In that way, you can have a far more effective approach that will be aligning, yes, with national missions, but doing so in a far more effective manner. So there's a, a difference in the scope, really, of policy areas covered. And then there's a, a different mindset around scale as well. So you know, even if you look at all the different devolution deals, including the ones that were concluded last year, there's still about 30 million people in the country not covered by them. And of course, they are still, just as with the funding buckets that we've seen, they are still ultimately presents that are handed out, you know, as I call it, kind of sweeties that are handed out by Whitehall and Westminster, rather than there being ultimately, you know, the other side of the coin mindset from the beginning, which is that really central government should have to explain why it won't devolve, rather than that being a gift that comes from central government. So that's why we've said, you know, the onus would be on central government to explain why, if you have a bottom-up engagement, you know, as we've been just talking about, that sets out sensible plans for devolution around whatever areas of policy we're talking about, it really should be for government to say why it can't do it if it believes that it can't, and to have a proper framework around that, rather than the kind of, unfortunately, often very politicised approach that we've seen. So, as I said, I think three main differences, you know, the theory of what drives growth, but then also scope and scale of change. Thanks, Annalise. That was, that was very clear. Um, and again, plenty there to, to get into. One, one thing that came up prominently in each of your um, discussions was the importance of, of devolution. And Annalise, you gave sort of quite a specific um, reason why you think the way the government is going about it is not quite right. Um, but I wonder um, if I could ask the other speakers, you know, the, the white paper it was quite ambitious on, on devolution, at least relative to where we had been before. So do you think that its approach is the right one? How would you like to see its approach to devolution differ? And Abby, I'll start with you. Oh, I think we, we may have temporarily lost Abby, um, in which case, oh, are you, are you back with us, Abby? Oh, I think you're on mute, Abby. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yes, I am. Sorry, but I missed the question as the connection went down. Sorry. I was talking about the, the government's approach to devolution. Um, you know, it, devolution featured prominently among all of your um, statements, but Annalise was quite critical of the, the way government is going about devolution. Uh, do you think the, the, the sort of deals approach is the right one? I, I think it's a, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because at least with the deal scenario, there is a conversation taking place. But, you know, there is an element, isn't there, here that, um, in my opinion, local government and central government are a partnership. We're here to it together. As I, as I tell people, the Prime Minister, as lovely as he may be, is not my boss. He doesn't call me up and tell me what to do. The residents of the city that I represent um, are the people who, to a degree, tell me what to do. They, they elected me. Um, in and my peers may be the leader of the council and therefore my relationship with government is one of give and take isn't it where I'm able to say certain things to them uh, wisely or unwisely and they have conversations with me too and that's how we get the best out of each other so in a way the deal scenario is helpful isn't it in that you're doing that but I think what what I struggle with is the parameters and the boxes that are within that I'm a unitary authority leader that Stoke Trent is not is not parished so there's only kind of one conversation that's going on in terms of what happens here and I find it quite hard then when the call goes out to find a single responsible person well, I'm the single responsible person. I was elected by my peers to be the leader of the council and I appoint my cabinet. So I am the, the only elected person here with responsibility. Everybody else, to a degree, is a political appointment uh, at my behest. So therefore, why could I not have those powers that would be equivalent to those given as a course of a deal to a mayor in another area? A quarter of a million 
people live within Stoke-on-Trent, 600,000 people within three quarters of an hour's travel to where we are. So we're a significant area. And I guess for me, that's the challenge. Less so, that the, less so as I say, the premise of a deal and more so really the, the very specific, you must fit into a certain box to get the responsibilities, which I'm not necessarily sure always brings out the best in areas. Thanks, Abby. Richard, Manchester is an area that has sort of got quite a long history of, of, of collaborative working and devolution, obviously does fit into the, the mayoral box. What's your perspective on the government's approach to devolution? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, Greater Manchester, it, it has it got to a place that's a certain amount of maturity in, in the partnership and it works quite well. And I think that, the, the, you know, you need three things for, 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 for this to work. You do need to start with democratic accountability. And I think uh, that 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 is really important, you know, that's where you know, local enterprise partnerships didn't work because they didn't really have that democratic accountability. I think you do need, you know, analytical capacity. You need, you need capable officers who are able to, uh, and who are able to come up with strategies. And then you need the resources and levers. And, um, you know, in a sense, much of the particular short term end of the, the levelling up agenda is really an attempt to uh, uh, to to, to uh, redress the fact that uh, local authorities have been starved of resources for some time. And there's a, you know, that's just a very straightforward way of uh, <coughs> addressing some of these problems. So I, I you know, I, I, I don't have, I, I'm not the sort, I, 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 I don't have enormously strong feelings about whether you need. Um, you know, the precise institutional form, but I think those are the three elements that you need. And, you know, Greater Manchester has got them. I hope that uh, other places will develop them as well. Not that Greater Manchester is perfect, you know, yeah. we're all in this journey. Absolutely. And, and Jane, any thoughts from you on the government's approach to devolution? Well, obviously I come from a very different perspective and my experience is, is very different, but I do agree very strongly with Abby's point about... about um, the role that we play as leaders of local authorities and the responsibilities that go along with that. And um, actually, we can be trusted in terms of decision making as, as well. It's, it's a huge responsibility, but we are closer. And, and here's one of the challenges, I think, with regard to this. So there's a lot of rhetoric around it, but we are actually closer to our communities than, than government. And from my own perspective, within the Welsh context, um, we've recently had new legislation that introduces corporate joint committees for the four regions in, in Wales. And I suppose you could say that does impose a degree of collaboration. But in my own area, we were already working in that way through the um, Cardiff Capital Region City Deal. So, and we've benefited from UK government investment through, through that. But I do think there's a gap here in terms of public awareness as well. So, so I'm very aware that we're having this discussion today. But if you asked somebody out in, in the street in any of our communities what levelling up meant to them, um, well, in Newport, they tell you two unsuccessful bids into UK government. <laughs> but but um, I, I think there is a gap, isn't there, emerging also between um, the aspirations of the government at that high level of, of governance and what is actually happening in communities mm. and as part of this we need to be closing that gap too mm. because it's those people that actually elect us. Mm. Both you and Abby have, have referenced that the levelling up fund has obviously been quite a high profile levelling up policy. Um, Abby I know that St Stoke was a, a relative winner from that process. There's been quite a lot of criticism about that being the way that government allocates money to these projects, suggesting there should be more flexibility. Do you, do you think there's a place for these funds, or would it be better to take a different approach with the money? I think absolutely. Um, local government financial sustainability is a, a massive issue, and clearly, as somebody who's passionate about local government, it's frustrating that it doesn't get the headlines that it, it perhaps deserves, bearing in mind that actually we deliver so many services to so many people, uh, and really keep the wheels turning on our places, respectively, around that. I think, you know, the challenge with funds like this is it takes a huge amount of effort and resource to bid for them. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to say, yes, Leveling Up Fund's great because I've been a beneficiary of it, but equally I've been on the other end of putting a lot of effort into bids for things that we weren't successful in either. So I guess, you know, fundamentally, I would probably say it would be better if actually we were able, as Jane says, to be trusted. We, we are trusted. We deal, here in Stoke on Trent, we deliver 700 services every day to over a quarter of a million people, ensuring that we're looking after everybody here and providing a great many services. You know, we're clearly um, 
pretty trustworthy organisations as a result of that. And it would be better at times to receive the money um, in a different way. I, I guess the flip side of that, though, for government is back to then the capacity that they would need to do that. And equally, the need for them to get to understand places rather than, you know, the, I, you know, I'm delighted with my levelling up fund allocations, but there is still quite strict quite criteria around the boxes within which, again, your bids can fit in. And trying to explain to people that, you know, the Chancellor didn't actually rock up with a wheelbarrow full of £56 million in cash for me to spend on what I want. Actually, I received the money for specific things. is quite tricky. Hmm. And Annalise, would funds like the levelling up fund be a thing of the past if there were a Labour government? Yeah, we, we don't feel that competitive bidding approach is ultimately something that's either in local areas' interest or indeed our economy's interest in the long term. I mean, a lot of what you know, Abby mentioned, um, Jane as well, I'm very well aware of from my discussions with councillors up and down the country, but also with businesses up and down the country and with universities up and down the country and FE colleges up and down the country. You know, I think we've seen when it's possible to have a longer term approach, working in partnership, that can be very effective at identifying you know, where there is a need for joint working, where, for example, skills policy or transport policy needs to go in the future, housing and so forth, all these cognate services that we need to be working on together and where there are local specificities. As soon as you have one competitive pot of money pitting areas against each other, often with pretty short timelines, actually, for local authorities to bid into huge amounts of officer time, a lot of money spent on consultants actually as well, you're not going to be really delivering the change that you want to see. And I just wanted to end by saying that you know, I was looking up the statistics on you know, the last fund that we've just been talking about. Even when you take that into account and the allocations that come out of it, of the 151 local authority areas, only eight of them with that cash injection are actually back to where they were in 2018 in real terms. So, you know, there's been a kind of partial refund for some areas on where they were, but really ultimately this is not going to be a recipe for economic development up and down the country. Yeah. Great. I'm just going to ask one more question, then I'll come to questions in the room. So do, do be thinking of those. And I mentioned in my opening remarks that since February last year, you know, the cost of living crisis has, has really come to dominate proceedings. And that has made things harder, both for people individually, but also for the government fiscally. So I suppose my, my question, um, briefly to each of you, is is it realistic to expect the government to be making lots of progress on regional inequalities in this time of, um, sort of cost of living crisis? Um, Abby, I'll come to you first. Um, I guess there's probably a bit of a structural question here, isn't there, in that arguably, um, and I am obsessed with local authorities because I think local government is great and it needs far more attention. So I'm going to unashamedly use this as a platform to talk about that. We do lots of things every day, everything from looking after children to older people, delivering housing, economic regeneration, providing library books and all sorts of things. So is it too much to ask the government to be able to do similar? I suspect not. But actually, there is then a need, isn't there, for that deeper level of understanding. And as I said in my opening remarks, really, to a degree, the allocation of funds, and I, I do, I, you know, I'm not going to under, undermine the fact that a huge amount of work goes in, and I'm sure, you know, the bids are read through and are analysed, et cetera, et cetera. But building things, so cash for economic regeneration, is relatively easy to do. Whereas getting to the root of some of the statistics we heard earlier about public health is much harder because you can't just throw cash at that as an issue. Um, you do need a longer term plan, you need commitment to that, and you need to ensure that's fully funded all the way through. It's no good starting off with an initiative that you fund for two years and then wondering why suddenly we haven't addressed adult obesity or infant mortality or think, you know, smoking um, related deaths or things like that. You need to have a longer term plan with commitment that is costed all the way through to that change. And that requires that requires space to think about and it requires a plan as well to put into place. So um, so I'd like to see more. I'd like to see more government engagement around around doing this. Um, and what I would say in terms of the challenge around cost of living, um, as somebody who turned their life around a couple of years ago and decided I wanted to be all active and run around and do things, having never done that for the first 40 years of my life, it's really easy to put off things and saying at the moment when the cost of living crisis is in place, 
people are not worried about remaining healthy or things like that. You know, if you can't afford to feed your kids, does it really matter how much sugar is in the cereal? The reality is it's going to be a ticking time bomb, though, isn't it, for future generations in terms of funding if we don't do that. And that, to go back to my first point, local government, we managed to do loads of things all at once. So I don't think it's beyond the wit of the government to be able to do lots of things at the same time as well. Great. Thanks very much, Abby. Richards. Yeah, well, let me pick up a point that Annalise made. I mean, the cost of living crisis isn't something that's just happened in the last few months. What's happened is that since 2008, productivity growth has pretty much ground to a halt in the UK. That's led to wage stagnation for more than a decade. That's led to the government's fiscal difficulties. You know, the country is in a deep economic hole because its productivity has stopped growing and it's falling behind other countries. So the the and that the, this productivity issue is intimately related to the, the, the regional uh, disparity question. As I say, to go back to the fact, if you've got the, the country's major cities not performing, you know, performing below the, 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 the UK average, if you've got the UK's economy basically driven by London and a bunch of small cities around the southeast, it's, uh, one cannot expect to have the kind of prosperous economy that would allow um, us, you know, that would feed into people's wages, to people's own standard of living, but also the ability of the government to finance public services at the level that people want. So I just, uh, you, you know, we are in a real uh, economic mess that's of quite long standing. Uh, you know, it's come to a head because of uh, the, you know, some of the, the, the events of the last year, but it's been, it, it's been building up for more than a decade. So it's not a question of, oh, we can postpone sorting out our economy till, till some later day. We have to do it right now. It's, uh, the whole thing is just even more urgent because of the, the, the fact that it suddenly becomes much more obvious and apparent that, that we are in this economic mess. Mm. Thanks, Richard. Jane? It's a question of priorities, isn't it? And I, I would say there's never been a more important time to, to continue with this and really invest in this. And I, I just wanted to pick up on the, um, the point about inequalities in health. So we work on a regional basis in terms of our economic growth and skills, but also in my own region, um, our, our local wellbeing plan for local authorities in the region, we're working to become a marmot region because we recognise the importance of addressing those inequalities in health. And actually by bringing the work that we do on the economy together with that work, we do hope that we will improve outcomes for everybody within our region. But this is not the time for the UK government to give up on this. This is the time for them to invest quite significantly in it. Great. And Annalise, finally, you know, if, if a Labour government were, were to come in, you would be dealing with the cost of living struggles as well. How would you sort of weigh those up? Yeah, I, I agree with the rest of the panel, but I don't think there's a choice here. You know, I don't think we can just say, OK, fine, we'll, we'll try and deal with regional inequality later, because that's to misunderstand the problems that we've had, you know, particularly over the last decade. You know, it is clear, as Richard was saying, that we've seen you know, declining rates of productivity growth in a lot of the country, that we've seen stagnating wages. I mean, there are a range of different reasons for that, but the two are linked, I would say, also around labour market uh, regulation too, and that's why we think we need to have a new deal for working people. But we have seen that sluggish growth up and down the country, and that does mean <laughs> that you can't separate off, hive off levelling up. You actually have to make sure that you deal with that regional inequality to build more sustainable growth that's stronger in every part of the country in order to move forward. You know, I agree here with Lisa Nandy, when she made a speech, I think it was here actually, not that long ago, and said, you know, when ultimately people can see quite how badly things are broken now, there's even more of an argument to act and to, to think boldly around these questions, and that's what we're seeking to do. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I'm now going to take some questions in the room, so please do raise your hand if you have one. Um, gentlemen at the front, right in the front row here, just wait for the... Mike, and please do say who you are and where you're from. Thank you. Yeah, um, my name's Simon Lydiard. I'm a former senior civil servant. Currently, I'm head of central government at Dragon Gate Market Intelligence and its sister company, Breaking Barriers. Um, I'm very interested in, in the role of civil service relocation in, in levelling up. The government has committed, I think, to move 20,000 jobs out of London to the regions and the nations. Uh, Gordon Brown's commission, I think, mentioned 50,000. I think, if handled properly, 
uh, moving jobs from, from London to, to the nations and the regions could have a significant impact on, on levelling up, particularly if you build a coalition uh, with local schools, further education, higher education and business mm -hmm. to recognise the potential that local areas have and, and, and if you concentrate on, on that potential rather than just do a vanilla drag and drop. And I'd just be interested in the, the panel's view on that, please. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions in the room at the moment? I'll take them together. No? Okay, in that case. Oh, sorry, yep, please see, yeah. Hi there, um, I'm Matthew Taylor from Red, Redwoods Consulting, so we're a public affairs corporate PR agency um, in the property sector, so hence interest in this. Um, yeah, my question was more somewhat to the politicians in the room um, in terms of um, the councillor, sorry, I forgot your name, from, um, from the, the leader of Stoke Council, um, in terms of what, how do you think it's going, in terms of levelling up, I feel like from the last election, we want to level up, we want to make places better, but in terms of delivering results and targets, it seems quite a it seemed like quite a nebulous idea with what are the KPIs and how are you being judged and how do you feel that the electorate are, um, what are you selling, what's your messaging to the, to the electorate to sell those, po those policies and what you've done so far in terms of delivery? Um, I suppose to Annalise, it's more, I get what you're saying about how you want to change the approach and do something different, but at the end of a first Labour government, um, what would you say are the things that you want to achieve and have in place um, moving on from the critique of the government to actually, your, I appreciate you're going through a policy programme at the minute, and a sort of side point off the agenda, um, the chap from Manchester, um, it seems to be quite noted that Manchester was quite successful in re redefining itself, regenerating itself. Um, in the sort of 90s, I suppose, like what advice would you give to other sort of areas of the country that aren't doing so well, those big cities, to um, that what Manchester did well to, um, to yeah, to make, to, to, to advise them? Sorry, that's a very butchered question, but I, think I, you, hope, you, I hope you, you get what I mean. Three questions in one there. <laughs> um, so, so we've got a question on the, the role of civil service relocation. Um, about how levelling up is cutting through on the grounds, um, about what a Labour government will want to achieve. Um, and then final question about how, how Manchester has, has done what it's done. So, Annalise, I'll start with you. Feel free to take um, as many of those questions as you like. Yeah, sure, and thank you very much both. Um, first of all, Simon, I, I agree with you. I think it can be very important, and I agree with the point around partnership, but I think there's also a need, of course, to have that partnership and to have, ultimately, Westminster and Whitehall believing they need to have that partnership with local government in every department, and we don't see that, we would argue, to the extent that we need to see it, and we need to have those discussions, but not as part of that kind of competitive mindset that so often we've been seeing, and indeed talking about this morning, uh, this afternoon, rather. Um, questions around uh, metrics, I mean, we, we, we would agree, that is one of the things, actually, that we would focus on. So, you know, Lisa Nandy has set out the fact that we would want to be examining well-being, sustainability, connectivity and resilience, you know, kind of boiling it down, really, and having something that's more tangible. But we have set out quite a number of measures that we would want to enact speedily. So at the turn of the year, Keir set out proposals for a Take, take Back Control Act, um, and he indicated how it would include, as I was talking about, a broader scope of areas. You know, some of that includes some quite specific measures around employment support, for example. Interesting, the government seems to now be talking about links between local NHS and employment support finally. Well, that's good, but you know, we set out how we would try and deliver that speedily. Concrete changes around transport control over those. I was talking about childcare as well, um, and also energy efficiency, other areas too. But as I mentioned before, having that very different approach to devolution, one that's kind of more grassroots up rather than saying, well, you have to have a specific model. You know, you have to have a mayoral model, for example, in order to be able to control more. Now, of course, I couldn't guarantee that would happen immediately because we want that to be coming from ultimately those places themselves, you know, and drawing on their plans for the future rather than Westminster and Whitehall dictating to them. So it's that different mindset that I think would be embedded quickly, but then you would see those policy differences as well. We've committed to them happening quite quickly. Great, thanks very much. Abby, how's levelling up, cutting through on the ground, and what do you think about civil service relocation? So, um, 
I think it got through reasonably well. I think, you know, the, the point that's been made is around what does it mean to your place? Um, uh, and I think I touched on this when I started. We launched our own prospectus a couple of years ago, um, which basically highlighted the four areas that we said, these are the bits that we need government to help us with. Transport, economic development, education and skills, and health and productivity. Um, and, and we are interested in help in those areas. So, Yes, the KPIs are important, and I, you know, I can quote some quote some great stuff. Um, second, uh, pitched as second best place coming out of the economy for job creation, ahead of everywhere except Cambridge. That's no contract. Um, Eight thousand jobs created in the last five years. All, all sorts of things like that, and that's really important. But actually, so is the tangible relationship between the particular things that you choose to do on the ground. So you know the the projects that changed the dynamics of the housing market in the city, where we have one of the biggest social housing portfolios in the country. But what that's done um, has meant that we've got very little um, very little larger housing. So we, we have kind of two, three bedroomed houses. We don't have anything bigger than that. So people leave the city. We struggle for things for single people, whether it's people who are care leavers, whether it's students who graduated from university, people who just simply don't want to garden, want to live in the pond. We don't have anything like that. But equally around skills and aspiration, and that in a way links in then to the question about civil service. So Stoke on Trent actually, and I haven't shouted anywhere near enough about this, is the second largest beneficiary of the Places for Growth plan. 550 jobs coming to the city from the Home Office, but the point to make is they're not actually coming from London. These are jobs for local people, and that is the really important bit. Yes, it's about bringing skills here that we haven't got, so we will be home to the Home Office's innovation centre here, building on our reputation, believe it or not, even though my internet dropped for being um, a gigabit city, um, having a fantastic university at Staffordshire that's one at the forefront of um, digital around that. But actually, it is about aspiration for young people because people from my city need to believe that they can go on to walk the corridors of power just as much as somebody who's grown up perhaps in London or, or elsewhere where things and life chances are very different for them. So I think the civil service element is actually really, really important. And we need to make more of it. I need to make more of it. As I say, stoke on is receiving the second largest movement of civil servants out to anywhere in the regions. And that's really important. That sends such a strong message, doesn't it, about your place, but also about the fact that you are on the radar for government. And I would definitely say that as the leader of a second tier city. Manchester's great and Birmingham are great and all credit to them for what they do. But actually, this is also about other places and there are other places of population growth within the country that do fantastic things that just as much need to deserve this level of support. Thanks very much. Richard, what's, the, what's Manchester's secret sauce? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, you, you know, Manchester has had, uh, a, a, I think, part of its consistency. There's been a long-term vision. There's been some very strong leadership in driving that vision. I think, uh, you know, and in the time of, you know, Richard Lees and Howard Bernstein, they had a very powerful view about what, what should happen. I think there's very mature politics. In, in, you know, it's not that there aren't arguments, and it's not that people don't, you know, don't have different views. But I think uh, Greater Manchester has found a way of kind of working through those in, in a fairly mature way. And I think you know there there is something about the self confidence of Manchester, which is very distinctive. And you know, I've only been in Manchester three years. I went from Sheffield, and that there's a, a, a very uh, big, big difference there. Still, you know, I think one shouldn't forget there's a lot to be done. I mean, the, the economy of Manchester is probably a lot weaker than the public perception uh, uh, um, would, would make you believe. You, you know, Manchester, talking about Manchester City rather than the whole of Greater Manchester, even Manchester City is a very, very uh, a divided uh, uh, place with lots of very, uh, uh, you know, very poor parts of it. So th th there's still a lot to be done in terms of that inclusive gr growth and taking the success of uh, uh, the success that GM has had uh, and, and spreading that both throughout um, you know, Manchester itself, but also through all the ten boroughs. So there's still a lot more to be done. But it's yeah, yeah it's consistency, grown-up politics, long-term visions. They, uh, and you know, I mean, the relationship with the government's been quite interesting because they've uh, 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 the the the. The, the local authority, the, the, the city leaders, have always dealt with whatever governments throw at them. They've got a long-term vision and they somehow managed to weave that into whatever fashion the central government has that particular month. And I think that's been uh, quite an achievement. I can say about the civil service relocation, I think that is important. You know, 
we, we've got a bit of government officer science, the, 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 the Bayes net zero team, a big chunk of DCMS. And what's important about it, I think it's, you know, once you think about it, it's not just about getting a bunch of well-paid professional jobs. It has to be, if it's going to work, it has to be if you've got people who are doing policy making and having real influence, because I think there are different perspectives that, that, that people will have by being outside London. <coughs> is, is, that, that, I think, is the most important thing. If we can have central government slightly more informed by the fact that the country is not entirely the same as the, the, the country as you see it from London, that can only be a good thing. Anything more to add, Jane, or can I move on to some other questions? I, th I think um, just, just on the point about the civil service, so um, in the part of South East Wales that I'm from, there's actually quite a lot of um, government agencies. Uh, and uh, whilst that plays an important role in the economy, I, I think um, even if we can continue to distribute uh, civil servants and government department representation across the UK, that's that doesn't provide a complete solution. It, it does in terms of public sector investment, but we cannot ignore the private sector. We ignore the private sector at our peril. Mm. Great, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions online and hopefully have some brief answers and some time for one more round of, of questions. So I'm going to take the top two questions um, online. The first um, is anonymous and says, academic evidence shows that devolving taxes actually has more of an impact on local growth than devolving policy areas like skills or transport, so should more taxes be devolved and how should this be done? Uh, notable that sort of devolution of tax, certainly in the Living Up White Paper, was, was very much not on the table. Then the second question, somewhat related, should the Treasury be doing more to support levelling up? And if so, what should it be doing? Um, maybe I'll go back the other way this time. So Jane, would you like to kick uh, off? Taxation. Oh, that's a really interesting question that I haven't got a proper answer to because um, obviously being based in Wales, we do have tax rates in powers now. Mm. And there's been quite a debate actually um, around the budget challenges as to whether income tax should increase when some parties think it should. And, and Welsh government have explained quite clearly why at this time they feel it would be inappropriate to, to do that. So, um, so it's interesting, but, but I haven't got an answer. Can you just Nothing. remind me again of the second one? Yeah, is it, what should the Treasury be doing? Could the Treasury be doing more to support levelling up? And if so, what? I'd, going back to the, the point about levelling up and how the decisions are made, I think um, we've all emphasised the importance of trying to drive productivity. So in terms of the decision making around levelling up, I would say there could be a greater prioritisation of investment which will drive forward productivity rather than some of the nice-to-haves because um, if, if you look across... Um, if, if you look across the UK, actually some of the investment through levelling up is, is nice to have rather than <laughs> going to deliver on that productivity. Great. Peace. Richard. Uh, I'm going to dodge the question about uh, devolving taxes, but I do, what, what I want to say instead of that is to, is to point out that actually the, the current situation that we have is that we have very big flows of money from the prosperous parts of the country to the less prosperous parts of the country. Uh, but those flows are essentially, um, for, for some reason, that the Treasury seems very happy to uh, spend lots of money supporting, essentially bailing out economic underperformance. And it's very reluctant to spend money to invest in ways that would raise productivity. Uh, and I think, you know, this is one of the, of the unfortunate things about the kind of level, the, the levelling up um, uh, discourse is that, you know, that there are people in, in, in London and the South who think, well, this is a very bad idea because it's just about shoveling money from, from London and spending it in Stoke-on-Trent and Manchester and Newport. But the reality is that at the moment, huge amounts of tax revenue are moved from London to Newport and Stoke-on-Trent and Manchester to support public services in those places because their economies are weak. They're too weak to generate the tax revenues that would be needed to support public services at the level that people want. So I think that the, 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 the tre what the Treasury could do would be to be much more focused on what are the productivity enhancing investments that it could make in these places with the goal that in the future 
you won't need to have those big current revenue uh, transfers that you currently have. So I, you know, I always try to frame levelling up. It's about how to make those places that are currently not doing very well economically, how to enable them to be more economically self-sufficient. And then in the future, maybe they could devolve taxes to them. Great. Thanks very much. Abby, what do you think about that? I, I think, you know, I would, um, I would build on those excellent points. Um, a few years ago, when we kind of first started on our levelling up journey as a place, we would talk about becoming a net contributor to UK PLC as opposed to a net taker. And, you know, some of the biggest challenges are around persuading um, people far, far away in London who've got no idea what it's like to be somewhere in Stoke, you know, couldn't find it on a map, really what it's like and how they could help. One of the things that, um, you know, you end up doing is is doing that yourself, which is back to probably the tax raising element on this. And we were um, awarded enterprise owned status in 2015-16 for a project. I remember being told we'd never get anywhere with it. Um, at the end of this year, we will have developed out 50% of our brownfield sites. And of course, there are various things that come with having an enterprise zone, um, enhanced capital allowances or business rates being the biggest ones. But they, uh, well, certainly business rates, actually ended after five years. And I could see that our pipeline of development would end at that point. And I lobbied for two years, HMT, around how successful it had been. And all they could tell me was that but the numbers weren't big enough for them. But actually, what it's done for us as a place, you can't underestimate the value of turning brownfield derelict sites into businesses and into jobs. And the enterprise zone has created nearly 2,000 jobs over the last few years here. And as I say, 1.5 million square foot of new commercial space has been developed as a result. So we actually underpin the business rates as a city council because I understand the value to my place of doing this, both the significance of the development itself, but actually also the economic value. And yes, we do have a lower wage economy here in Stoke-on-Trent than we do in London. But if we never, ever receive any support, then that will never change. And what do they always say to you? If you do what you always did, you'll get the result that you always did. And I want to make a change. So we put our money where our mouth is and we underpin that. But I think actually getting HMT into that place where they can see the value of this, as, as other contributions have already said, is, is a really important bit. Because actually there's a huge amount that can be done to help. Um, Annalise. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I agree with the anonymous questioner <laughs> about the burden of evidence here when you have such an unequal country as we see in the UK, of course, the most regionally unequal in the OECD. And actually, very often, you know, most studies would suggest that you would just be devolving pain ultimately if you went down uh, that route without an enormous smoothing mechanism. And, you know, in Germany, they've been working on this for many decades and it's absorbed, you know, huge amounts of political and administrative and economic efforts in order to get to a system that is still contested by uh, many people within the country. So um, I think what is important, however, is indeed related to the, the second question, which was about the, the mindset coming from the Treasury. And I would say that, you know, what I'm going to say is not a comment on the civil service, but it's more around the kind of political framing of a lot of this, that I think there hasn't been the long-termism that we need. And, you know, Rachel... Reeves, as our shadow chancellor, is very much committed to that, having that longer term framework so that you can have your local economic uh, strategies ultimately drawn up um, in partnership and not think it's just going to be put in a drawer indeed in the bin, um, that you will have that longer term trajectory. Um, but then that you'll also have a partnership mindset from the beginning and not view that as a diminution of fiscal control. You know, you have to do it properly. You do it in a way where you're sure that you've got strong auditing, that you've got strong processes, but that does not mean that you'll dilute your ability to achieve your missions in government. Actually, it means, as we've been talking about, you've got more of a chance to achieve them. So it does need to have that mindset change. Yeah. Great. I'm afraid that um, does take us pretty much to time and I can't, can't hold people longer than the hour. Um, I'm sorry to all of those in the room and online who had more questions. Um, it's been a great discussion, but we could have gone on for at least twice as long. Um, so a reminder that um, the live stream will be available if you want to watch any of that back shortly on our website and on YouTube. A massive thank you to Policy at Manchester for making the event possible today and to, to Richard in particular for joining the, the discussion. Thank you all for coming um, and if we could all finish by um, thanking my panellists.